Pyrrhus of Epirus was a great general, one of a handful of leaders able to deal significant damage to the ambitions of the Romans. According to Plutarch, Hannibal himself called Pyrrhus the second greatest commander of the age, only behind the great Alexander. So truly a man that was so great and so powerful, and a man who was a storied general. He must have had a glorious death in battle, right? Well, not quite. How does being clobbered by an old woman sound? <laughs> Stay tuned to find out how and why King Pyrrhus of Epirus died. But before we get going with that, guys, if you do enjoy this video, we're on the road to 3,000 subscribers, so smash that subscribe button and click that like if you enjoy this new historical content. Although, of course, this video is titled A Thousand Ways to Die in the Past, in order to understand his death and its context, we must unfortunately talk about his life a little bit. Now, there are many and some great videos on the life of Pyrrhus, so we'll keep it relatively brief, but we'll focus mainly on sort of his mid to late life. When Pyrrhus invaded Italy in 280 BC, he did it under the pretext that he was going to defend the Greeks of Tarentum from a Roman attack, something that the Greeks themselves had provoked by driving the Romans out of the nearby town of Thuriae and sinking several warships. Something that the Romans, they themselves provoked by breaking a treaty that prevented them from putting warships there in the first place. Ancient history is bloody complicated, I tell you. But the point is, Pyrrhus really did see this as an opportunity to carve out his own empire in Italy. Pyrrhus initially saw great success, clearly beating the Romans at Heraclea, their main issue being that they hadn't yet really significantly fought against men trained in the battle tactics and formations of Alexander and Philip II. Dionysius of Halicarnassus claims that 15,000 Romans died on that day along with 13,000 Greeks. However, obviously a more conservative and likely uh, depiction seems to be Hieronymus of Cardia, who puts the numbers at 7,000 and 3,000 respectively. This victory marks a high point for Pyrrhus in Italy, as Rome had many enemies and Pyrrhus was joined by most of them. The Brutii clan, the Lucanians and the Samnites among others. Pyrrhus, buoyed by this victory, decided to deal a fatal blow and march on Rome itself. And he got to within 60 kilometers of the city before suing for peace. And although according to Plutarch and Cassius Dio, many senators were obliged to peace or a truce, old blind Appius Claudius Caicus, who had been carried to the Senate in a litter, made a fervent case for continued war. So the Roman Senate voted unanimously to dispel Pyrrhus's envoy from the city and to continue the war. That was not the first time and only time Pyrrhus would come up against an old person who would beat him. Pyrrhus saw the writing on the wall as more legions were returning to Rome and enclosing in on him. Namely, the legion of consul Tiberius Coruncanius recalled from fighting the Etruscans. Therefore, he returned to Campania for winter, dogged all the way by the legions. It was after this winter in 279 BC that Pyrrhus invaded Apulia, where he captured several towns and cities. The Romans caught up to him around the town of Asculum, where battle would ensue. The Romans were led by consul Publius Decimus Mus, and he, of course, vied for blood. There were widely varying accounts of this battle, Plutarch claiming it took place over two days, but Cassius Dio says only one day. Plutarch says Pyrrhus won. Cassius Dio says the Romans and Dionysus of Halicarnassus doesn't even say who won. So who knows? This all goes to show how confusing and brutal a battle it must have been. But it is from this battle that we get the famous term Pyrrhic victory, and I'll let Plutarch tell it. The two armies separated, and we are told that Pyrrhus said to one who was congratulating him on his victory, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, 
we shall be utterly ruined. For he had lost a great part of the forces with which he came, and all his friends and generals except a few. Moreover, he had no others whom he could summon from home, and he saw that his allies in Italy were becoming indifferent, while the army of the Romans, as if from a fountain gushing forth indoors, was easily and speedily filled up again. And they did not lose courage in defeat. Nay, their wrath gave them all the more vigor and determination for the war. So, in 278 BC, after a rather a bit of a stalemate in Italy, Pyrrhus was offered a couple of opportunities, both the Kingdom of Macedon or an opportunity to drive out Carthage from Sicily via a cry to help from the Greek cities there. In perhaps a fateful decision, he went with the latter option and he sailed to Sicily where he immediately lifted the siege of Syracuse. He was then proclaimed the King of Sicily pretty much on the spot. It wasn't long before he had all of Sicily under his control, taking Eryx, the strongest fortress of Carthage on the island, leading the rest of Sicily defecting to him apart from Lilybaeum. When peace negotiations turned sour, Pyrrhus laid siege to the fortress of Lilybaeum and he finally met his match. His siege was unsuccessful after two months of assaults, and the Sicilians, who were once so happy to name him king, began to defect, even willing to side with Carthage once Pyrrhus had made the island basically a military dictatorship. But it was ultimately news from Italy that would cause Pyrrhus to return home. All but Tarentum had been reconquered by Rome. Pyrrhus's small empire was coming to an end, and when he returned to Italy, the new fresh armies of Rome were too much. After half a decade, he decided to head home. Although his army and coffers were weakened significantly, Pyrrhus went to war almost as quickly as he got home. This guy just loved having a war, fighting the rival Antigonus Gennatus, the king of Macedon. He won pretty easily, taking most of Macedon with one large battle at Aus. But it was Pyrrhus' undying, burning ambition that would eventually see him killed. In 272 BC, Cleonymos, a Spartan with a claim to the throne, asked Pyrrhus to invade the Peloponnese and place him on the throne of Sparta, even though Cleonymos was widely, widely unpopular. Again, Pyrrhus did not see this as a favour, but a great opportunity to claim the Peloponnese for himself. He was beaten back at Sparta and his firstborn son Ptolemy was killed in the retreat. Pyrrhus, maybe feeling at a loss, was offered the opportunity to intervene in a civil dispute in Argos, a nearby city. There were rumours that Antigonus Gennatus was coming with a new army, aiming to beat Pyrrhus and take back his lands in Macedon, but Pyrrhus aimed to enter the city, and he tried to do so with stealth. But when he did, the streets were crowded with hostile soldiers. It was here, at the confused and bloody Battle of Argos, that Pyrrhus would finally die. Finally, we have reached the great man's death. So, how did such a great general and commander ultimately meet his end? Was it charging the enemy in a fit of rage after seeing a good friend die? Was it valiantly leading his men while they were whittled down until eventually he was the last man standing? No. <laughs> what happened would make you open mouthed in disbelief if it was written in fiction. Pyrrhus of Epirus was fighting a soldier in the narrow streets of Argos. It was then that the soldier's old and decrepit mother, who was watching from a nearby rooftop, saw her son in danger. She promptly ripped off a roof tile and threw it at Pyrrhus, where it struck him from his horse and paralyzed him. But it gets even worse. After he was struck from his horse, a soldier by the name of Zopyrus attempted to behead the king, but managed to somehow miss and strike him across the jaw and face. It took Zopyrus several attempts to finally sever 
his head. So, not such a great death after all for the man. And just to reinforce the almost comical nature of the tale, I think it's best if we refer back to Plutarch once again. Here, he was surrounded by a spear which pierced his breastplate. Not a mortal, nor even a severe wound, and turned upon the man who had struck him, who was an Argive. Not of illustrious birth, but the son of a poor old woman. His mother, like the rest of the women, was at this moment watching the battle from the housetop. And when she saw that her son was engaged in conflict with Pyrrhus, she was filled with distress in view of the danger to him and lifting up a tile with both her hands, threw it at Pyrrhus. It fell upon his head below his helmet and crushed the vertebrae at the base of his neck, and so that the sight was blurred and his hands dropped the reins. Then he sank down from his horse and fell near the tomb of Lysimnius, unrecognized by most who saw him. But a certain Zopyrus, who was serving under Antigonus and two or three others ran up to him, saw who he was and dragged him into a doorway just as he was beginning to recover from the blow. And when Zapyrus drew an Illyrian short sword with which to cut off his head, Pyrrhus gave him a terrible look so that Zapyrus was frightened. His hands trembled and yet he essayed the deed. But being full of alarm and confusion, his blow did not fall true but along the mouth and chin, so that it was only slowly and with difficulty that he severed the head. So there you have it. One of the great generals of antiquity, killed by a grandma with a roof tile. Truly as unfitting a death as one can think of for someone like the warlord that was Pyrrhus. After his death, Antigonus called for him to be adorned for burial and burning, a mark of respect for what he'd done in his life. His legacy, of course, still exists today with words, with the concept of ruler healing, maybe. Yes, really, it may have originated from Pyrrhus, as people claimed his right toe would heal wounds of the spleen just with a touch. That's why his right toe was preserved after his death and kept in a temple. Very nice indeed. And also... The legacy of his tale, of course, taking the fight to a growing Rome, has fascinated people for millennia. So, that was 1,000 Ways to Die in the Past, guys. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, please do like and subscribe. That would be fantastic. It really does help the channel out. And I will see you all again on the next video.